most people who think about fighting terrorism think about killing the terrorists. But I realized that this wasn't going to work for very long because the terrorists reproduce. We can't kill them as quickly as they reproduce in the context of a movement. And so I decided to go around the world talking to terrorists and ask them why they do what they do. I didn't want to just rely on the data made available uh, to us by various governments. I wanted to actually sit down with terrorists. And I went to Indonesia, and I went to India, and I went to Israel, and I went to Gaza, and I went to Lebanon. I spent a lot of time in Pakistan. And one of the terrorists I met there... I was a very frightening guy. Uh, when bin Laden was found to have been speaking to someone before he was killed recently, it was this man, Fazlur Rahman Khalil. And I went to see him in his headquarters in Islamabad, and it was all... It was awful and dirty and kind of scary. And I, I felt that there was a, a kind of deliberate theater of trying to frighten me, uh, a kind of jihad chic, a way of looking. <laughs> and they served me tea in these filthy cups with buffalo milk. And I'm telling you, you want to avoid that if you possibly can. And he was giving me the party line about how there was no training camps in Afghanistan and so on and so forth. And something happened, and a thought came into my mind that I should ask him about his wife. And so I did. And he told me he had a new wife. He had one that he'd left with his parents, but he'd recently acquired a new wife. And I asked if I could meet her. And I think, although he'd clearly prepared for this interview, and I was thinking the whole time it was being monitored by Pakistan's intelligence agency, and indeed I wouldn't have been able to carry out that interview without their wanting me to do it, uh, he, he wasn't prepared for that question. And he said, yes, I could meet her. So he took me to his home, which wasn't very far from there, very different from the office where he met people. It was a giant mansion. And in this house was his gorgeous wife, a young woman, highly educated, whom he'd met in Saudi Arabia. And we had a very interesting conversation, uh, in, in, partly involving her feelings about terrorism, what it was, and how I was misunderstanding what the word meant. Shortly after that, I met a, a young man who had left this organization. He understood what was going on. He understood that the rhetoric that he was hearing about what Fazlur Rahman Khalil was about was totally different from the way he was living. He understood that Fazlur Rahman Khalil had met this wife, picked her up in Saudi Arabia because he went there frequently on fundraising missions. He was fabulously wealthy unlike his followers. And this young man decided to quit. And he actually sought my help in possibly getting asylum. That stayed with me for many years, that experience. Now I want to tell you about another terrorist I met, this one in the United States. This one was the scariest terrorist I've ever talked to. And I only talked to him on the phone. He was an MIT-trained chemist, definitely not the image that most of us have in our mind about what a terrorist looks like or is. He was a chemist who, one of his first projects was to turn red lights into green lights, which I thought showed a sense of humor. He was impatient, and he didn't want to wait for the red light to turn green, so he came up with this gizmo. But he also came up with a scheme called assassination politics, which was his plan for ridding the world of what he called slime balls and miscreants. That was his term for officials who work for the United States government, especially in the Internal Revenue Service, the organization that collects taxes. He owed a lot of back taxes, and he really had it in for the IRS. So he had a plan to reward people with digital cash if they would 
take out a slime ball or a miscreant. He was a, a revolutionary. He recognized that the internet was a very important way to spread terrorist ideologies, especially to people who can't function in groups. The kind of people who have fantasies about killing many, many people, but would not be capable of doing it. They couldn't carry out a September 11th kind of attack because they cannot function in groups. But as technology keeps improving, individuals like this man will be able to get a lot more done. And he knew that. He said the internet is changing the nature of terrorism. Now I'd like to fast forward a little to the, the news magazine, the terrorist news magazine called Inspire. The aim of this magazine is to inspire people all over the world to join with the Al-Qaeda movement. And in that magazine, among many other, quote, inspiring articles, was one called How to Make a Bomb in the Kitchen of Your Mom. <laughs> Just last week, there was someone picked up in New York who had been inspired by that recipe to make a bomb in the kitchen of his mom. This magazine is making inroads. This magazine and magazines like it are making inroads all over the world. The internet has become an incredibly important recruitment and education tool for terrorist movements. We are going to see the end of Al-Qaeda and the movement that it inspires. In 20 years, There'll be some other terrorist organization that we'll be talking about in my world, the people who think about terrorism. It won't be Muslim extremists, but it probably will involve some kind of social networking that Inspire Magazine and others like it are taking advantage of. This is a, a very important change that I think we've been very slow to recognize. What would happen if instead of going after terrorists and their supporters with unmanned area of aerial vehicles, we tried to spread a counter narrative? What would happen if I could deploy that young man that I met in Pakistan who spoke so eloquently about the heartbreak he felt when he realized that the leader that had, in, had inspired him to a life of jihad was not living the way he insisted his followers live. He was a wealthy man who was making money off the efforts of the hundreds of hu and thousands of humiliated young men who were buying into an ideology about humiliation and that the way to overcome humiliation was by becoming a terrorist. That's the most common story I've heard. And it's a story that I've heard not just among Islamists, but also among Christian terrorists that I've talked to. People who want to kill abortion providers, Jewish terrorists who want to take down the Dome of the Rock. Humiliation is absolutely key. And finding an identity with dignity is absolutely key. What would happen if we took people who had actually joined these terrorist movements, who had felt that humiliation, who had found this new identity, but then began to realize that that identity wasn't enough? And this is what happens. Terrorists get old like the rest of us. And they find that they want to have a normal life. And they begin to see that what they were doing, the story they'd been told, that they could make the world a better place by actually going out and killing people, that that was wrong. That they, in fact, should have been listening, and this comes up a lot, to their mothers. Indeed... <laughs> Google Ideas, a new organization founded by Google, recently brought together a large group, about 100 former terrorists, 
as well as victims of terrorist crimes to talk about why they'd gotten recruited, how they got recruited, and more importantly, how they left, why they left and how they left. And so much of what we heard focused on two things, identity, the identity they finally found, a clear identity within a terrorist group, and what their moms told them about why they shouldn't have joined and why they should leave. And it sounds trite and almost unbelievable. Here I am, I'm a mom, uh, and I think moms are important in the counterterrorism fight. Well, it turns out that if you talk to terrorists who have left their organizations, they say the same thing. What Google is trying to do is amplify the voices of these terrorists who have left. And this is something that I'm trying to do with Google. I think this is a, a, an idea definitely worth spreading. And I hope that if there are any terrorists who have left their organizations who are watching us now, that you will think about how to get that story out. It's absolutely critical that we that find individuals who are courageous enough to say, this is why I did what I did. This is the mistake I made. This is what I've learned about how I can help others either not join or leave. I want to tell you just a little bit about what the Saudi government is doing in this regard. The Saudi government, oddly enough, is one of the thought leaders in the area of counter-radicalization and helping terrorists lead, leave. They've established an organization that involves psychiatrists, psychologists, religious leaders, and believe it or not, art therapists. And they work with individuals who have been captured. Some of them actually have been uh, spent time at Guantanamo or other prisons where they were tortured. It's a lot of work to help these young men leave the life of a terrorist and go back into normal life. And they end up with a lot of support. Their families support them. The Saudi government helps their families support them. The Saudi government gives their family members jobs. The Saudi government gives the former terrorist jobs. They give them cars. They find them wives. In essence, they are helping them find new identities.